The number of Americans who applied for unemployment benefits rose last week. It was up by 13,000 to 242,000. That indicates uh, that the labor market is beginning to soften, but those claims are still relatively low. Unemployment benefit claims is one of the best ways to measure whether the economy is getting better or worse. In addition, U.S. worker productivity fell unexpectedly in April, and in turn, that means labor costs went up together with nearly 70,000 job cuts in April, and that puts the pressure on the Federal Reserve to possibly continue raising rates. Time now to check on how the U.S. markets reacted to all that. John Terrett at the New York Stock Exchange. Well, another negative day on Wall Street on Thursday, not at all helped in any way by the what seems to be an ongoing and deepening regional banking crisis. Two banks in particular on Thursday, PacWest and Western Alliance in focus. PacWest down another 50% on Thursday, Western Alliance down 38%, and a new bank for you called First Horizon, which is based in the south of the country, in Memphis, in Tennessee, shares down 33% after it was left rather foundering after a $13 billion takeover with the Canadian bank TD fell through. It's all pointing to Wall Street thinking that the administration better start guaranteeing all bank deposits for the foreseeable future, not just the 250,000 that are guaranteed by the FDIC anyway, and all the deposits at select banks when they choose to. After the closing bell, Apple gave us their earnings. They beat on the top and the bottom line. There is a $90 billion share buyback coming. The dividend is being increased, but that revenue stream was less than last time round. Anyway, in the immediate aftermath of the news coming out, the shares were ahead by about 2%, fluctuating between 3, 1, and 2 right in the middle. On the markets, then, a down day because of the banks. The Dow by just under 1%, the Nasdaq by half a percent, S&P 500 down by 7 tenths of 1%. Bitcoin had a good day. It was up $500. Now, later on Friday at 12.30 GMT, the next big piece of inflation data that the Federal Reserve will be interested in, and that is the jobs report for the month of April. John Terrence, CGTN, on the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange. For more on this uh, and the U.S. economy, we're joined by Anthony Chan, former chief economist, J.P. Morgan Chase. Good to see you, as always. Um, please, Anthony, fix the problems here. We've got the inflation that's apparently not fixed. We've got these rate hikes that are really starting to hurt the economy. I mean, that's what experts are telling me. And this whole bank thing, a day after uh, Chairman Powell says the banks are strong, et cetera, it's a disaster today. Well, I think that right now what you see is uh, a lack of confidence uh, on the part of uh, depositors, on the part of investors. I think that regulators are doing their best to, to try to put out the fires, but there are so many of them that it's uh, become a real challenge. On the part of the Federal Reserve, I think they're doing uh, the best that they can. They basically gave you the signal that uh, they would not rule out the possibility of a of a pause. I wrote a uh, Substack article on this uh, topic right after the Fed released it under the People's Economist, and I predict that uh, they will pause. And when I released that report, what we saw was that the financial futures market was predicting with a certainty of about a probability of about 77 percent that they would uh, pause when the next meeting takes place uh, in mid-June. Uh, but guess what? Today, that probability Fair went enough. even higher. Fair enough. But go, let's go back 24 hours. Why raise rates at all if you plan to pause? I don't see how this is going to marginally impact the problem when it comes to specifically inflation. Well, I don't think that the reason for them to raise rates last time was absolutely necessary. In fact, on your show, uh, I've uh, said that uh, I thought that they should have paused, but the reason why they didn't pause is simply because they're worried about their inflation-fighting credibility credentials. They lost a lot of that when they talked about inflation being transitory, and now they're moving that pendulum uh, to the other side. Uh, however, they are trying to make up for, for lost time and, and perhaps pause on the next one. But I don't disagree with you, Phil, and in fact, uh, with, uh, as I said, with other commentators on your network, I've said that they should have paused. But again, that real constraint of losing credibility, which is, by the way, similar to what's going on in the European Central I, Bank. I, I, we Anthony, know that. The I under, Anthony, I understand the credibility issue, but by doing that, we're c causing more consternation in the overall 
credit markets. We're causing consternation in the financial markets. We're causing uh, more questions and answers from the in, uh, investors. The bond market doesn't believe the Fed. They're thinking they're going to cut rates sometime in the fall or end of summer uh, all the way into next year already. I mean, if you look at where the predictions are, we see those models going forward. So we bo those both can't be right at the same time. Doesn't the Fed care about the confidence issue that you brought up? If we're losing confidence, it just seems to me that that's a big, big part of the overall economy. Well, Phil, if your assessment that the bond market doesn't believe the Fed uh, is true, then the Fed doesn't have to worry as much because the financial markets eventually will believe that the Fed is not only going to pause, but is also going to lower interest rates. What they're doing now is to try to maintain that uh, inflation-fighting credibility. I don't disagree with the view that by raising rates, they make the situation worse. And that's why uh, they took great pains. And in fact, the Fed chairman said it repeatedly that they changed that word because con conditions have changed. So they are trying to now convince and pivot the market in the direction of, uh, of a pause. But you also said they don't want the markets to think that the Federal Reserve all of a sudden is thinking about cutting rates or even pausing because they're panicking. Because if they give that impression, Phil, even though you may think it's well-intentioned, that can certainly exacerbate conditions. My concern is over the next couple of weeks, every month we've had one or two major bank issues, right? We just went through one. We may have one another uh, uh, come out this weekend, possibly the next weekend. You see the same stocks that I see, okay, and, and where they're priced at. They're all priced for a major problem. And I don't know how we're going to solve this credibility issue unless the FDIC or the Treasury Department comes out and not implicitly, but explicitly provides a better backstop to the financial system. Otherwise, a week from now, we're going to have the exact same conversation. Two weeks from now, it's going to be the same thing. Well, I think that the Treasury and the FDIC have basically uh, labeled some of these banks as systemically important so that they can backstop all the deposits. And you might say, well, why don't they just do it to all the banks? And the reason for that is quite simple and straightforward, and that is that authority is granted only by Congress. And right now, in our polarized uh, political environment, uh, it's not likely that both Democrats and Republicans will be able to agree to raise that uh, deposit insurance limit uh, and help the situation, because some parties uh, are not necessarily in favor of helping the other political parties. So that's an issue. That's one of the reasons why they have to deal with this almost on a case-by-case -case basis. Is it the right way to go? Probably not, but it is the, w the only way that uh, uh, they can operate in our uh, right. polarized uh, political environment. So lastly, look, th there's a real impact. We throw out a lot of numbers. We throw out our, our sort of thoughts on this. But the, the truth is, is that banks are tightening credit. They're making it harder to borrow money. That's going to make it harder for small businesses. That's going to make it harder for many individuals across the, the customers of 4,200 small and medium-sized banks across this country. They're doing the work of what the Fed probably wanted them to do, which is to reduce demand, which we're seeing now already. What does our economy look like in three months? Our economy, if you look at the Atlanta Federal Reserve uh, GDP tracker, which I've mentioned in the past uh, as being one of the most accurate uh, barometers of what really is happening, it's still telling you that economic growth uh, in the second quarter is still going to be positive and close to 2%. So uh, right now, the economy is doing just fine. I think that as you go towards the end of the year, the economy will slow precisely for the reasons that you uh, mentioned. We've not seen uh, the money supply this week. is actually declining on a year-over-year -year basis, almost as uh, faster than we've seen uh, since uh, the 1930s. So that's telling me that the economy is going to slow down. Now, I do realize that there are a lot of studies out there that suggest that the money supply relationship to the economy has weakened because of quantitative tightening and quantitative easing, that all those relationships have weakened. But I don't want to totally ignore it. So I'm going to go with the view that by the end of the year, the economy is going to be so weak that it's probably going to fall into a recession. But again, that's the price we sometimes have to pay to lower inflation, which is unfortunate, but a reality. It's an it's a interesting time that we live in. Uh, Anthony, uh, I love having you on the show. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.